more on this atomic footing, the models of the atom. So how do we know that any of these are correct? I mean, we can't see an atom. So since we can't see an atom, how do we know? We know through experimentations. All the, all the sciences I previously talked about, they all use experiments to try to figure out what's going on. Um, we also do it with heating in a flame, inducing electric currents through them, latest technology, observations from experiments have provided evidence that help us to make changes or refine the model. How we see it, we can use what's called a spectroscope and we begin by taking the light that's emitted and we break it up into its parts. That light that's being emitted tells us about the energy level of the substance we're working with. This is what's called the foundation of quantum theory. Okay, we have classical theory, which is what was taught all the way up until the late 1800s. And then early 1900s, you had a group of scientists who said it just didn't match up with what we were seeing with the experiments that were running. So there's a debate on at this time if it's acting as a as a particle or as a wave. It's called a wave particle doubt, wave particle duality theory. So when we look through this, we get readouts like this. And this is called element spectroscope, spectroscopy. And every element has a fingerprint. So if you were to identify these out in the universe, we could bring the light in and we can actually pull it and bring down the spectro uh, spectroscopy of it and we can identify each element by the wavelengths given off. And that's pretty cool. And the wavelengths are being given off because the electrons and how they're acting in their shells. So all of this is gonna help support what we understand about the atomic theory. But then we also have crystallography. And in crystallography, you take a crystal and you slice it thin, and then you shoot an X-ray at it and you get readouts like this. Well, then you use math and you are working on trying to figure out the 3D orientation of that crystal. So the simple atomic model, um, understand all models enable us to gain insight into the atom and they help us visualize a world that we cannot see. We now understand that in the center there is a nucleus and in that nucleus there are protons and neutrons. Protons have a charge discovered by Ernest Rutherford in the gold fool experiment. Neutrons have no charge and are equal in mass in protons, discovered by James Chadwick in 1932. He later spends the rest of his life um, fighting insomnia. He couldn't sleep after that. Outside the nucleus are the electrons. Electrons are really tiny compared to the protons, so they don't actually add much mass at all. And that's why the AMU is derived from the protons and the neutrons. Negative charge, discovered by J.J. Thompson in the cathode ray tube experiment, and he's the first one who got started on this. The big idea. An atom has a nucleus made of protons and neutrons and electrons orbiting the nucleus. That's what we're taking away from this. So technology connection. Using a scanning tunneling microscope today, it is possible to recreate an image of atoms. The instrument does not magnify a sample of matter like a traditional microscope. Instead, the instrument has a tiny tip that scans the surface of the sample in order to create a topographical map of the surface. Physics connection. When charged particles are placed near each other, they move toward or away from one another. Similar charges repel or move away from one another. Opposite charges attract are moved towards one another. You can see this with a magnet and iron phalanx. And this is a recent one, a student connection. In 2018, a student from the University of Oxford captured in photo a single floating atom with an ordinary camera. This picture won him first place at a science photo, photo contest. And that's the picture right there. 
So all of this we use to help us understand what they look like.